Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are gonna be doing a deep dive on some of the Tesla Roadster PCB design files. Specifically, we're gonna be looking at the vehicle display system design files. These design files were recently made open source, and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun to take a look and see what's in these design files. And one of the things that you're all gonna learn is what some of the larger companies will do in order to document everything that's needed in their designs to mass manufacture a product. So let's jump into All Team Designer and see what's in this design package. Make sure you hop into All Team Designer and follow along. We recently ran a design challenge and we got so many great submissions from all of you folks in the audience. And so we decided to run another one with these Tesla Roadster files. So if you wanna get an edge on the competition, make sure to hang around through this video and learn everything that's in this design package. So first things first, let's jump into this zip file and we can see everything that's included in this design archive. Now, when you open up the zip file, you're gonna see two folders inside the zip file. First, you're gonna see a folder that has all of the bare PCB fabrication files. You're gonna see a bunch of folders in here and if you start opening up these folders, you're gonna see a .pho file in each of those folders. So that is a photo plot file and it's basically a Gerber file. There's a PDF in one of these and you can see here if you open this that this is your fabrication drawing so here you've got your drill symbols you got a drill table all the tolerances everything you'd expect there to be in a fabrication drawing that's all of the fabrication data and of course if you want you can go through extract all of these files and put them into the cam editor in Altium Designer take a look at the actual production files. Next, let's take a look at the other folder. This other folder contains native Altium files. Now, you've really only got two Altium files in this folder. The first one is a PRJ PCB file, and then the other is the PCB doc file. You should notice here that there are actually no schematic files in this archive. The schematic, however, is in a PDF. And so you can see right here in this screen, I have the PDF of the schematic pulled up. There are some other PDF documents in this folder as well. So for example, we have some assembly PCBA drawings that I'll run over momentarily. That's everything that's contained in this design archive. So first let's jump into the schematics. The schematics, of course, were produced on the Tesla Roadster back in 2006. So naturally we would expect there to be some older parts in this design. If you start scrolling through some of these pages, you might see some part numbers that you recognize, some you don't recognize. For example, here you see some SN74 Schmidt triggers. Here we see this strange part number for an MCU. I don't know anyone that uses an LH75401 MCU. But if you just start looking at some of these part numbers, you may find that some of these are actually NRND or obsolete. So for example, this LH75401 is discontinued at DigiKey and if you go over to the NXP website and look up that part number, you'll actually find a page on the support forum that states that this particular part is obsolete and discontinued from the NXP portfolio. So if you wanna use this design, you're gonna to have to procure one of those old chips from an overseas vendor, or you're gonna to have to swap out for a new microcontroller. Next, if we just scroll down, you'll see some other parts in here, such as, for example, these Cypress memory chips. If I just go back over here to my internet window, you will see that this particular memory is also an obsolete component. So just another example of a part that needs to be replaced if you actually wanted to build this. So although there are some obsolete parts in here, the design is pretty thoroughly documented. And if you wanted to, you could go through and recreate schematics from all of this design data that you see here on screen. Now, as you start looking more through this schematic, you're gonna see some other parts that are really like a blast from the past. So for example, this MC74, if you just put that into Google or DigiKey or Octopart, you're probably gonna land on a page like this, click through to one of these products and you're gonna see 
it's also obsolete. Some of these other chips that are in here, so for example, like some of these power regulators, some of these are linear technologies chips, and if you go over to Octopart and search for these, you'll actually find that these are still in production. So not all of the parts are obsolete, but a lot of the really main critical parts are obsolete and would need to be replaced if you ever wanna do anything with this design. Now, one of the main things that is, of course, missing from this design package, which I didn't mention earlier, is any of the firmware. So this is a really big roadblock to doing anything with this design. You'll notice here, of course, we have a microcontroller that runs pretty much everything in the board, but without that firmware, the microcontroller is really not useful. If you were to use this design, not only would you have to switch to a new microcontroller, but you would also have to write all of the code from scratch. With that in mind, let's take a look at the PCB layout file. Here, I'm inside the PCB layout file, and for those of you who have ever done a migration from another CAD tool, you will notice here up at the top in the file name, it says pads-ascii. This file was converted from pads. Even though it was converted from pads, it's a pretty good conversion. Um, you can see here that pretty much everything you would expect is in this design. There's gonna be some reconfiguration that is required and I'll run over what that is, but you can see here we have all the parts and a lot of routing in this design. Well, first, what do we see here? We see that we have all of our drawing layers embedded in the PCB layout file. So that's pretty common in a lot of the legacy CAD programs and you know, even I do that in some CAD files when it's actually requested by a client. Here you can see we have the title block and we have all of the assembly information and then that gets mirrored over to our assembly data that you can see over here in this view. In addition to the assembly data embedded here, we also have something else which is our conformal coding layer. Now the formal coding layer may not be obvious, but if you just turn on this layer, you can see that there's these little callouts to different parts of the board, and then there are some notes here, and it kind of looks like an assembly drawing. Well, that's what one of these PDFs is. So if you go over here and you look at the PDF, you'll see here it says conformal. This particular design used a conformal coding on pretty much everything on the board except for these masked areas. So you can see here that some of these mounting holes were masked so that they don't get applied with a conformal coating, um, some of these connectors, and so on and so forth. There is a specific conformal coding document, and that conformal coding document has its own assembly notes, as you can see right here in this left side of the window. So let's jump back into the PCB layout. Here, if I just go back to the PCB layout and I turn off some of these other layers that we don't really need, you're gonna see here that we've confined this down just to the signal and plane layers. So there are a few things going on here. So first things first, when I just put this in single layer mode, you can immediately see that as all the other traces fade out, there's a lot of nets that are unrouted. When I go through here and I just do some quick net highlighting, you know, some of this is ground. So this was probably filled in with ground pour, or what you can see here is that the ground net configuration is actually incorrect. It's not connecting to these nets like you would expect. So there's some sort of error here in the net list that's preventing this ground plane from connecting to some of those vias. So even though there's some sort of error here that's preventing these grounds from getting connected with this plane, um, you can see here that it is present and there's just gonna be a little bit of cleanup that you need to do to make that connection. Same thing down here on layer six. Here on layer six, we also have this assigned to ground, but for whatever reason, it's not making the connection. Same thing, you'll just need to go into some configuration and change that. The next thing that we have here is we have two power layers. And I thought it was interesting that both of these power layers are assigned to the same net. You see this one is assigned to VDD, and then if I go back here to layer three, this one is also assigned to VDD. You really don't need to have two power layers that are assigned to the same net like this unless you're dealing with really high current. In this instance, we're definitely not dealing with high current, so not really necessary. You can take that other layer on, let's say, layer seven, change that to ground, or you could rearrange these internal layers a little bit so that you actually put ground between layer four and layer five, and that will help provide some shielding for the signals on those layers. So next, let's just take a quick look at layer four and layer five. On layer four and layer five, you notice something that is pretty standard when you have two signal layers close together like this in a digital board, you can see that the routing is all orthogonal or it's all perpendicular. So here on layer four, we're going vertical. Here on layer five, we're going horizontal. This is, of course, very useful to help prevent coupling and crosstalk. Of course, you don't have to do it like this. 
As I mentioned earlier, we could rearrange some of the layer selections here and then maybe put uh, some ground in between layer four and layer five. And that will also provide shielding that will help prevent coupling and crosstalk. That's another option for dealing with any issues that might arise in terms of SI in this PCB. So that handles the layer stack up and some of the aspects with uh, layer selection. Next, let's just jump back here into the 3D view. Now in the 3D view, I, I always like to take a look at this because it's pretty instructive as far as what's going on with some of the standard design rules that you need to get the board built correctly. But you also can identify some really simple mistakes such as here you will notice that it has Tesla motors written right on the exposed copper. Same thing over here with the logo and some of the designators and some of the miscellaneous text. So for example, you have this very small U13 right here falls directly on exposed copper. That's a pretty simple DFM issue that we need to solve, and it can be easily solved if you just take a look at the design rules. So jumping into the design rules, we do see that there are some custom design rules that are already set. So for example, you see that there are some net specific design rules here under clearances. You'll also see that, for example, we have a net specific design rule for routing. However, the mask expansion rule is set to the default rule. So this is one of those things where, for example, if we were to just set this to, uh, let's say, all vias, and we tent all vias, we could easily apply that in the design rules. Just hit OK. And then once that update finishes, you can see here that most of those exposed vias are covered up and that's gonna handle quite a few of those uh, DRCs that we would have noticed earlier due to silk screen being printed directly on copper. 10 seconds later. Now, if I zoom out, you're gonna see some other interesting features on this board. And one of the things that you will probably notice here is that there are some fiducials scattered around. Fiducials, of course, useful for ensuring that a board is going to be in alignment when it's going into manufacturing. However, the fiducials don't follow the kind of standard, you know, three corner pattern that you see on most boards. What you will notice here is that instead, these fiducials are located locally to this particular chip. Now, this is called, of course, a local fiducial. And then it looks like you also have a couple of global fiducials. So if you dive into these design files and you see those local fiducials, that's exactly what's going on. One of them is local to the chip, and then the other pair here is global to the entire board, and it's used to ensure alignment for different parts and different regions of the board. So now let's just summarize everything that's going on with this design. So I'm gonna tell you some of the things I like and what I dislike. I think the main thing that I like here is that I think they made the right choice going with an eight layer board. Now, I don't agree with the layer assignments. I would have done it differently, but still they made a product that's functional and mass manufacturable. So good job there. Even though I had some criticism about the application of some of the design rules, I actually do like that they didn't pigeonhole you into a specific set of design rules. They left some of those DFM and DFA rules arbitrary. So that way you can take this and apply the rules that are gonna work for your manufacturer. And last, even though I would have done the stack up differently, I still think that they did the routing correctly given the stack up that they used. So if you just take a look here on layer four and layer five, they routed this in such a way that they are gonna minimize SI problems. However, they could have done a little better if they would have done an alternative layer stack, then they wouldn't have had any SI problems related to interlayer crosstalk. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to take a look at the link in the description. There is a link where you can download this entire design archive and start playing with it yourself. And if you did download these files, you're gonna have an edge over the competition in our next design challenge. Make sure to stay tuned to the channel for more info on that coming soon. And as always, folks, make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.